on uh, our Zoom channel. And uh, we'll head in now um, to kind of some main material for tonight's uh, study. Um, at the center of the Bible, we have this book called the Psalms. And the Psalms have a variety of things that are included. And we might have a favorite Psalm like Psalm 23, which we prayed together last uh, on Monday, actually. Feels like an eternity ago. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down uh, in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This familiar prayer, right, has some language that we sort of expect to be um, a prayer that's like cleaned up. It has clean language, right? Um, it, it teaches us to pray like the hymnal praise, right? Um, maybe you don't know this, but in the prayers of the day that we pray on Sunday mornings are actually written prayers that we have adopted um, from the publisher and the authors and the committees who put together the prayers uh, and the hymnals. And so we sort of like the Psalms because they give us a language or a, a vocabulary for prayer. But um, the lament psalms, which we're focusing on tonight, actually give us language of honesty. Um, in fact, uh, it is not polished language. Um, and as we'll see, there's actually some really surprising language in some of the psalms, um, what's sort of expected. Some of these psalms, particularly the lament psalms, are psalms that don't have uh, or are not wearing their Sunday best. They uh, articulate a truth of, uh, of what it means to be human. And so uh, that's why I thought it would be important for us to take some time to look at the Psalms. I have a dear friend of mine who was a colleague at seminary um, who did not grow up in the church and um, was invited actually to attend a potluck. And uh, she walked in and sort of surprised this uh, devout lady sitting across the, the table from her when she says, what's up with you Christians and sin, right? And she says, the lady across, <laughs> across the table about swallowed her fork, you know, because um, she just couldn't believe that somebody would talk like this. Um, but that is actually what the lament psalms do. They give us a language uh, to articulate the true realities and the deep questions of our faith. Uh, Bullock, who um, I have been using as a resource in uh, this study, uh, writes this about the Lament Psalms. While the boldness and the naked honesty of the psalmists may shock us, this attitude is nevertheless instructive for our own spiritual lives. Sometimes we hold back too much from God and we conceal our true feelings in prayer and create sort of a false image of ourselves at the throne of grace. What would happen to us and to our relationship to God if we were truly honest with God and with ourselves? Thankfully, there is a place in biblical faith for this kind of boldness before God. The Psalms of Lament carve out a spiritual niche for us where we can use the language of life's hurts and still stay within the vocabulary of faith. And so tonight we're going to take a look at these Lament Psalms and get to know what it means to express ourselves uh, truthfully, honestly, boldly before the throne of grace, maybe even using language that might surprise us all. There are some things that the Lament Psalms include. Uh, this shouldn't be considered like a form, like it has to follow this kind of um, first this, then this, then this, then this. Instead, there are some kind of characteristics or some traits of the Lament Psalms. First, they address God. They get God's attention. They say, hey, God, pay attention to us, right? And then they offer some kind of lament or a complaint. 
And usually that complaint uh, falls into kind of three categories. First, it's a complaint against God. As we'll read in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? And so we get a sense that God is to blame. Um, imagine being able to say that to God and with some confidence. It's your fault, God, that we're in this predicament. Um, there's also a, a second uh, kind of complaint that happens, and it's against an enemy. Uh, David uh, says, you know, my enemies wrongly accuse me, or my enemies come after me when he is running away from them in battle. And the third complaint, or the third lament, which I think is probably more characteristic of us as Lutherans, is that it's a complaint against ourselves. Um, as we say in the Confession and Forgiveness, uh, I am in bondage to sin and I cannot free myself, right? It's a lament. It's a complaint. I can't get free of this and I need somebody's help. So, uh, Almighty God, have mercy on me. After, the, after there is this lament, usually then there is a confession of trust. It's sort of like a creedal statement. It says, um, even though this bad situation is happening in my life, I trust in you, God, um, or I have seen your faithfulness, God, and I need you to come and be present to me and with me. And then because we're reminded of God's faithfulness or that we can indeed trust in God to be faithful, we ask God something. We offer or make a petition to God and say, God, be present to me. Help me in this uh, time of need. Uh, you know, go after my enemy and make them, you know, uh, may their wickedness fall on their head so that I can be free from them. And then last, of course, um, with the exception of Psalm 88, um, most of these psalms end with, a, with praise and thanksgiving. Um, I single out Psalm 88 because it's the only psalm in the entire book that doesn't have any resolution, which um, has been a helpful psalm for me in these last uh, days and weeks. It's a powerful reminder that um, even though we've gotten a lift on the stay-at-home order, we have a new uh, stay-safe order, right? And we don't know when the end of that is going to come or when the dials are going to be turned up. And so um, there isn't any resolution right now. Uh, the, greatest, um, the greatest kind of models or predictions out there is that this could be going on for 18 months to two years. That doesn't feel like resolution. It's a really small uh, thing in the span of our life, but uh, if, if it seems like an eternity. And so Psalm 88 is the one psalm uh, that we actually use during our liturgy during Holy Week uh, to say there is no resolution. For Jesus, there was no getting out of the cross and, the, uh, and eventually the empty tomb, which was God's vindication. But we don't get that in Psalm 88. There are a variety of lament psalms, and uh, I have a, a list of these for you, but uh, there are sort of four categories that I want to talk about uh, tonight in their variety. First, there are individual laments. There are uh, people who pray and ask God um, in their own personal situation for God to come and uh, liberate them or uh, vindicate them. And uh, they, there are many of them. I, I won't try to list them out tonight. There are also penitential psalms. And these are the psalms who recognize that the enemy is ourself, right? And uh, our, our bound will and the problem of sin and so somehow need to be free of that. And so uh, we have uh, the penitential psalms uh, that confess sin and then usually say, but you are a merciful God, right? Or uh, forgive me my sins. Psalm uh, 32 is a great example of a penitential psalm. There are also communal laments, like a whole community experiences this. And in some ways, I wonder if those, uh, those psalms would be helpful for us in our own time, in our own place, to pray these together um, as a, a church community that has a building, but a sanctuary that's sitting empty. 
um, we can know uh, these laments and the pain of being separated. Um, and so these communal laments are, are sort of helpful for us in that uh, the whole community of faith uh, is experiencing something and we, and we can articulate that. And then there's a fourth set of uh, psalms which are the imprecatory psalms. That's a fancy word for psalms uh, for uh, judgment or psalms for cursing. Um, believe it or not, in, uh, the t in the scriptures, Psalm 69, Psalm 109, and Psalm 137 actually ask for God uh, to judge the enemy. And there are sort of three things that happen in those psalms, right? Uh, the, they ask God to intervene and to judge the wicked. They ask that the devices of the wicked would actually fall upon the wicked's head and that the Lord would repay evil for evil. Well, uh, St. Uh, Paul will pick that up and say, you know, do not repay evil for evil, but uh, overcome evil with good. But that is not, uh, that is not the same in uh, this, the imprecatory psalms. Uh, psalm 137 is a surprising psalm where it asks that the children of the enemy would be, have their heads bashed against a rock. What a horrible, uh, what a horrible experience, uh, right? Um, what a terrible thing for us to pray for. And yet, in the Psalms, there is language for this. And so uh, it's helpful for us to remember that lament is really a pouring out uh, of sort of our very uh, raw, uh, visceral prayers uh, to God. Um, and that God allows for that in the space of the vocabulary of faith. Well, tonight I want to take a look at just one psalm together. It's Psalm 22. And as, uh, as we begin uh, that reflection, I want to begin uh, with a word of prayer. And then uh, we'll take a look at that psalm and then we'll move into some other, uh, some other thoughts. But uh, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, when your son was handed over to torture and felt abandoned by you, he cried out from the cross. Then death was destroyed and life was restored. By his death and resurrection, save the poor, lift up the downtrodden, break the chains of the oppressed, that your church may sing your praises. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I want to think together tonight about Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a, a familiar psalm. It begins, as I've already mentioned, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's probably that, that first verse, at least, is well known because it's used in Mark and in uh, Matthew's Gospels as Jesus is hanging on the cross. And so I'm going to read uh, kind of piece by piece. We'll go through the psalm together, and then um, we'll talk about how it fits the, the form or the categories or the characteristics of lament psalms. And then we'll uh, turn to kind of another uh, reflection and conversation that uh, needs to be had. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. There's an address here, right? God, my God, my God, oh my God, right? Uh, it's a prayer. And so uh, the psalmist addresses God and then offers a complaint and says, Why have you forsaken me? Why haven't you saved me? Uh, why, why do I cry out to you all day and all night and you never answer? I find no rest. The lament continues actually in verses six to eight in that uh, this, the psalmist says, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They, their mouths they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. 
let him delight in him. And of course, this is all mockery uh, for the psalmist because God, who is supposedly a helper and, and a deliverer and a rescuer, is not doing that for the psalmist. And so uh, the psalmist finds himself forsaken or abandoned. He says, I am scorned, I am despised, I am mocked. And then we hear these great confessions of faith. And there are two of them. First in verses three to five, where the psalmist says, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. And so in verses 3 to 5, the psalmist says, My ancestors remembered you. You sit on their praise because you were so great and you took care of them. And then uh, that's what then we hear in this return, in the beginning with verse 6, where, but that's not the case with me. I'm scorned and despised, mocked by all the people. And then in verse 9 to 11, the psalmist remembers or recounts or recalls uh, this impressive um, and wonderful faithfulness of God. Because even though uh, the person is scorned uh, or mocked, uh, he remembers in verse 9, You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, but there is none to help. I love those verses because it sort of reminds me of the importance of baptizing an infant, because um, from the moment of birth, right, we learn to trust God for daily bread at the bosom of our mother, right? Uh, we, we learn to trust in God because we are handed over to God in baptism, not to be left to our own devices as a helpless child, not left um, <laughs> uh, particularly as a firstborn child uh, to first-time parents, right? No, we are given over, handed over to God because God is the one who can help us. And so we remember, or the psalmist remembers, um, I wasn't abandoned. I was actually given to you, God, as a young child. And you have been faithful to me, uh, even from my youth, even from, uh, my, from being very young. And so then in verses 12, uh, all the way to verses 18, we hear these incredible uh, experiences right? Um, the lament sort of picks back up. It continues again. And it says this, people make open mouths at me. I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. I thirst. Uh, the, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I am pierced, my hands and my feet. Uh, they divide my garments and cast lots. Well, anybody who reads this, uh, as we do typically on, uh, on, this, on Good Friday, recognizes that this, these things happen to Jesus, right, uh, on the cross at Golgotha. And so it's no surprise to me that Matthew and Mark pick up the first psalm, uh, uh, the first verse of this psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because as they were reading the scriptures, they saw in Psalm 22, everything that happened to Jesus was written in this psalm. He thirsts, right? His hands and his feet are pierced. Uh, they divide my garments and for my clothing they cast lots. And so the, the complaint or the lament picks up again uh, in verses 12 to 18. And then we have the petition, right? Be my help. Deliver me, O God, save me. And that happens in verses 19 to 21. Listen to it. But you, O Lord, right? All these things have been happening to me. Uh, all these horrible experiences have taken place. It's awful, right? The psalmist doesn't uh, hold back anything, but simply just calls a thing what it is, says what's going on in their life. And then the psalmist continues, but you, O Lord, be not far off. 
O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. So be my help, come and deliver me, save me. And then the entire psalm ends. Uh, that's sort of the end of the lament, which is pretty powerful. And then it's uh, at the end of the psalm, verses 22 to 31 are all praise. And so even the lament psalms can't help themselves, with the exception of Psalm 88, as I've already mentioned, the, the lament psalms can't help but in the end turn back to God. And it's not, uh, and not only to turn to God, but to turn to God in praise, to give God honor, thanks, and praise for God's working in their life. Now, we don't know for certain um, when uh, or how these psalms came to be. Maybe it is that Psalm 22 verses 1 to 21 were written um, in the middle of uh, certain things, uh, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the strife, and then maybe uh, later on, uh, the verses 22 to 31 were written after God has sort of intervened in the situation. It was sort of funny when I was um, in, in March of my senior year of high school, I still hadn't decided uh, where I was going to be going to college. I had been accepted in two places, but I, I couldn't decide what to do. And I, I was having a conversation with my high school choir director, and we were talking, and um, in sort of the same pattern of uh, the Lament Psalms, which of course, this is going to shock some of you, uh, just be ready uh, for it. But um, in a way, uh, we were talking, and my choir director was also having some other family uh, scenarios and situations going on. And so we decided to write uh, our own psalm. And uh, it was just two verses long. And the first verse was, my God, you suck, right? You've given us great things. Uh, you've given us new situations. Uh, and it's just painful. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to get ahead, um, right? And so we just let God have it. Um, we sort of held God's feet to the fire and said, uh, now, of course, we didn't really think that God sucked, right? But the situation that we were in was really bad. And we didn't know how to work through that. Well, fast forward to uh, May, and uh, I've made a decision about where to go to college, and sh uh, her husband and, and she were, had decided that they were going to be moving up to the Twin Cities, right? And everything was sort of starting to fall into place, and everything was going well, and we wrote verse 2, God, you rock, right? And so that's sort of exactly what the Lament Psalms do. They let God have it. And uh, surprisingly enough, if, if the Psalms are really true and they're really scripture, then apparently God can handle um, every emotion, every anger, every experience, every vocabulary that we could use. I just love it when I talk to somebody who doesn't know I'm a pastor and they use this unpolished language, right? They can really let God have it in a way that uh, sort of is freeing. And then what happens is uh, in this really kind of terrible situation in these prayers that are just honest and real and true and visceral, um, on the back side, we see God's intervention, we see God's help, and we're able to praise God for who he is and what he's done for us. Well, the Lament Psalms actually help us to really become Lutheran, I think. Um, they help us uh, to understand what Luther talked about as a theology of the cross. And you've, this is not new language for many of you. Um, in, 19, uh, in 1518, Luther wrote the Heidelberg Disputation. It was a series of theses that he wrote for debate at a gathering of monks uh, who were getting together at the University of Heidelberg. And um, Luther wrote these uh, 
these theses and they were uh, kind of given as arguments uh, that were being made. And all of a sudden, Luther starts to articulate the realities of faith. And what he does there is he says there are actually kind of two theologies that are competing in the world. There is the theology of the cross, um, and then there's a theology of glory. And a theology of glory understands or claims to understand, I think that's probably a better way of saying it, it claims that it understands the invisible things of God. It, it's sort of like, um, you know, Toto grabbing the curtain uh, in, the, in, in Oz and being able to see uh, the great wizard, you know, spinning all the pulleys and wheels, right? And they look and interpret earthly things uh, through a theology of glory. And so um, by understanding the invisible things of God, a theologian of glory um, often will ask two questions. What is God trying to teach us? Have any of you ever tried to figure that out? Any of you uh, tried to figure that out in a pandemic? Uh, what is God trying to teach us? Well, um, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen God write it in the clouds as of late. Like, this is what I want you to learn from this. Um, but all sorts of people are saying that they know that this pandemic was for judgment on the world, right? Or this pandemic is coming to clean up uh, creation because we've been so bad. Well, all of those things may be happening in a pandemic, but we can't know for certain what it is that we're supposed to learn in this situation. Um, so some of you might like to be able uh, to make sense of things by asking those questions, but Luther says, actually, they're kind of unhelpful because you can't know for certain what God is up to in the very midst of these scenarios and situations. So instead of trying to figure out what we're supposed to learn, uh, a theologian of the cross just comprehends things that are visible. It simply says, we're having a pandemic and it's not fun. What a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful, honest and true reality. A theologian of the cross wants to figure out and interpret earthly things from the perspective of God. And a theologian of, of the cross just simply lives in the world and experiences the world as it is without trying to figure it out all the time. Well, that might actually free us up, friends. It might say to us, we don't have to have all the answers. Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Instead, we can just live in this moment we can experience all of life with all of its joy and with all of its sorrow and know that somehow God is working in the midst of it, even if we can't understand it. There's another aspect to a theology of glory that's really important for us to kind of uh, hold on to and talk about versus a, theo a theology of the cross. A theologian of glory is going to call evil good and we'll call good evil. And what I, what I mean by that is oftentimes uh, people will say, well, um, they must have gotten sick because God wanted to punish them. Well, that's not helpful, right? Um, it's actually terrible to say that to somebody. Oh, God must really not like you, so he's making you suffer. Uh, I don't think so, okay? Um, actually, I think... Uh, or you might hear, well, God blesses the wealthy, right? Uh, if you're wealthy, then God wants you to. Not helpful, friends. Uh, not really helpful. Because it doesn't uh, acknowledge our neighbors who have had to close their businesses for the last eight weeks. Who are wondering what their livelihood or whether the doors of their business are going to be open again. And so um, a theologian of glory will look at um, wealth and success and power and say, ha ha, we have found God and we have found his blessing. And that's where it is. Wherever um, there is wealth and success, that must be where God is working. 
And actually, um, as we know from St. Paul and from basically all of Scripture, is God doesn't want to be, is not found in the wisdom of the world. God is not found in the wealth and the success and the power and authority. Instead, he's found where? He's found in a manger, a lowly place. He's found um, sitting with tax collectors and sinners of all things. That is not glory, people. Um, in fact, to hang out with sinners is not good, right? If you don't believe me, just ask your parents, right, who wanted you to hang out with the right crowd. Um, and so what we discover along the way is that um, while a theologian is busy, a theologian of glory is trying to figure out the world and has all of these claims and ways of explaining what's going on in the world and is busy calling good evil and calling evil good, a theologian of the cross kind of goes with the flow. They live and experience the world as it comes, and they use the cross and the resurrection as the lens for understanding what's going on. And not just a lens, but actually grabs hold of what the cross and the resurrection are handing out. And that is, of course, the gift of faith. And so a theologian calls, a theologian of the cross calls a thing what it is. I think I've told this story to you maybe even um, on, on this uh, Bible study before. It's probably recorded somewhere. But I met with a, a young mother who had just miscarried when I was uh, a young pastor. And I went over to her house and um, <laughs> I just said to her, I said, this sucks. Right, I think that's um, the most authentic prayer. That's actually what I often want to say to everybody. This sucks, right? Um, when I walk into a hospital or I find out about a diagnosis, I often just think, man, this really stinks. Well, a few weeks later, I went back and called on this, uh, this mother who had miscarried. And she said, you know what, Pastor Cullen? Um, what you said that day was just shocking to me. I couldn't believe that you would say this sucks. And actually, it was the very thing that I needed to hear and to know that God was okay if, with me saying it. That's what a theology of the cross is willing to do. It doesn't have to put on fancy uh, language. It doesn't have to try to figure out um, how to be the most holy or the most churchy. It just calls a thing what it is. This pandemic, it's hard. The stay-at-home order and the social structures, which have just been absolutely um, blown apart, it's tough, right? Um, people who are worried about their livelihoods, uh, they're scared. This is not just about making a dollar. This is about being able to stay in their homes and feed their kids, right? A theologian of the cross needs to be able to say what's really going on. And so I have this amazing quote from Gerhard Ferdi. He was a, a Lutheran theologian of the last generation, um, and he just says some things that are so helpful about what a theology of the cross is. And I think that's what the lament is trying to get us to do. The lament psalms are trying to get us to understand a theology of the cross. And this is what it says. Theologians of the cross are those from whom all support other than the cross has simply been torn away. Anybody feel like every support in your life has been torn away? Um, I don't know. I kind of miss you, my congregation, right? Um, I like being able to see people respond when I'm preaching. I like to see you smile when we're singing, this is the feast of victory for our God, alleluia, right? Um, I love the idea of, uh, of being supported. And yet, guess what? All supports are, are tossed away, as the old hymn says. So the situation is not that we choose to be this or that theologian. We don't choose to be a theologian of the cross or a theologian of glory. It just happens to us, right? If you've gone through your whole life thinking that God blesses the wealthy, 
and then all of a sudden um, your business tanks or your 401k is not going to be able to support you in your retirement years. Aha! The cross has just happened to you. You see what I'm saying? So as theologians of the cross, we have to operate on a different premise. We can't say that we've got this all figured out. Instead, we have to trust. We have to operate on faith in the crucified and risen one. And that's all we have going for us. Can you imagine it? That Jesus, the one who was crucified and was raised from the dead, is the only thing that we have for us. Let that sink in. Let that settle in for a moment, friends. Um, as everything, even as we're starting to open up, right? Now we're going to start to see what we really do have. And over the course of these last weeks, God has been trying to show us we only have the cross and the empty tomb. We only have Jesus. We only have faith. And so far, faith is the only thing that hasn't disappointed us, right? So all the supports of a theology of the cross are, or a theology of glory are actually destroyed by the cross. The cross is the end result for a theology of, the, uh, a theology of glory. It always ends because there are no escape hatches. And so by faith, as a, as a theologian of the cross, we become truly human. We become a person who's able to live in this world, not ever trying to escape it, but to be fully present in it and experience all the joys and the sorrows of this time and place, right? You were born for such a time as this, uh, Mordecai says to Esther, right? Who knew? Uh, God knew that we were going to be living in this pandemic, but I didn't sign up for it. And yet here we are. We get to be truly human in this experience. And then there is nothing left for us to do but to wait, to hope, to pray, and to trust in the promise of him who conquers, the crucified and risen Jesus. By faith, by being a theologian of the cross, we are simply in Christ, waiting to see what will happen to us and happen in us. As Luther was reading Psalm 22, the psalm that we've just read tonight, he said this, Crux sola es nostra theolo uh, theologia. The cross alone is our theology. So we don't have to try to learn something from this, friends. We don't have to try to make sense of what's going on. We don't have to try to pull back the curtain on what God is doing in the midst of our situation. Instead, we can trust that God is actually working in the midst of our suffering and our pain, and also in the moments of joy and celebration. A theologian of the cross lives in the world and calls a thing what it is. When things are hard, we say it's hard. When things suck, we say it sucks. And the lament psalms are actually those things that help us, that give us the freedom, that actually teach us the language of a theology of the cross. To be honest with God, honest with ourselves, and honest with one another. To really say the way that things are. And then be surprised, or to celebrate, or to rejoice when God turns the corner. When our suffering comes to an end, when the dial, uh, to use Governor Walz's, uh, uh, you know, model, when the dial is turned up, right, we can celebrate that. Or to remember that when, uh, when our, our suffering and our sadness comes to an end because God raised the dead back to life. So I thought we would pray tonight as we end our time together. I know we've, uh, we've gotten a little long, but uh, let's turn to Psalm, uh, Psalm 13. And we're going to use this. Remember, it's a, it's a lament psalm. It's a psalm that uh, speaks honestly. It, it tells it like it is. And then um, also then 
uh, moves from lament into praise. And so we'll, uh, this is how we'll end our time together is with Psalm uh, 13. Let us pray. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice that I have been shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love, O God. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, uh, I would encourage you to find a lament psalm this week and pray through it, or maybe even write your own lament. We're coming to the end of the stay-at-home order. Uh, all of your emotions uh, are coming to a peak, and soon you're going to see God's deliverance. We're going to be able to get together with our family and our friends in small groups of 10, and you'll be able to turn the corner, right? You'll go from Psalm 1001, God, this sucks, to uh, verse 2, God, you rock! Uh, what a gift. What a gift that will be uh, for us. The Lord be with you. Uh, good night.